Excellent. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for your great patience with us as we uh, gave people time to get in. Um, I'm delighted to see at least some of you have made it in. Hopefully more will make it in over the next few minutes. And I'm delighted to welcome you finally to this second community forum for the NGLP project. So I am Catherine Skinner. I'm the executive director of the Educopia Institute. And on behalf of the Next Generation Library Publishing Team, it is my great pleasure, a little belatedly, to uh, welcome you to this forum. What we're planning on doing today is introduce you to or update some of you on NGLP itself. So NGLP, the project, has been aiming to transform the scholarly communication landscape. And we're doing this by empowering institutions to reclaim their research communication as a core activity of the institution itself. Library publishers, along with university and scholar-led presses, are providing such a crucial counterpoint and potential competitive alternative to proprietary and commercial uh, systems and publishers. And we really believe that these mission-aligned library publishers need interoperable and flexible tools and values-driven partners so that they can actualize the change in ownership and control of scholarly communication that I think so many of us have envisioned uh, within the library publishing spectrum. Uh, you can find a lot more information and background about our project on our brand new uh, website, which we just launched at nglp2022.org. And our work is generously funded by Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. And we are super grateful for the support of Lisbeth, Peter, and Ross Muntz, and uh, Christine Ferguson, who have both been great champions of our project as well. In the first half of today's uh, forum, you're gonna get introduced not just to NGLP, the project, but to its backbone, which is the forest framework, which we are really, really excited to be rolling out uh, light launch today. Um, this is the value-centered approach that has guided everything about the NGLP project and all of the, the work that we have done, both on the technical and on the uh, more organizational side. And what uh, Sarah will do is share with you why we have pursued the direction that we have, what it is that we're really trying to do in NGLP that demands us to start with values and principles, uh, and, and to talk you through how we see this as a, an ongoing guide, not just for our project, but we hope for the sector as a whole. And then we will move to talking about the NGLP's launching pilots and introduce you to our initial three pilot partners who are with us today. And then we will conclude with uh, live versions, uh, uh, you know, display a demo of some of the live versions of the NGLP software components, the web delivery platform and our analytics dashboard. And then we'll end with a look at what's next and give you some opportunities to get involved. Um, this is very much a community-driven effort. There are lots of people that we owe everything that you're about to see to um, in terms of the guidance that they have given us along the way. And if you're not already part of that team, then please do uh, use the links and the resources that we'll be providing here to uh, indicate your interest in joining us. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Lippincott, who uh, will introduce herself and uh, get us started with the real presentation. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> My name is Sarah Lippincott, and I am the NGLP product owner. And I'm going to tell you about a little bit about uh, the framework uh, that is guiding all of the NGLP product project work, as Catherine said. And all of this work started with an ambitious question. What would it take to transform a sector? NGLP is working to improve and increase open publishing pathways and services for scholarly authors, editors, and readers. And we are doing that by building a counterpoint to the dominant uh, model of scholarly publishing, which is profit-centered, treats information as a commodity, and, and limits its circulation to increase its value. The and the end-to-end -end environments that are designed and sold by for-profit, uh, you know, profit-driven publishers are creating significant barriers to autonomy and choice within the within the scholarly communications sector, and the price tags associated with publishing and and accessing content uh, are prohib prohibit the fair and equitable production and and diffusion of knowledge. 
NGLP aims to, to change that. And our answer to what would it take to transform a sector is building holistic solutions. Our project doesn't aim to build a single monolithic technology. It doesn't aim to promote a, you know, one new uh, OA funding model, but, build, but rather to build a modular and interconnected suite of tools, resources, and services and networks that, are, that can empower libraries and other mission-driven publishers to be leaders in scholarly communication um, and to reclaim research communication as a core activity of, of the library uh, and, the, the, and academia um, and to, to put values at the center of that. Library publishers, so we, we knew that library publishers need tools uh, that will um, that meet them where they are. Um, so they, uh, that take into account their local context. And you'll hear more about, uh, about the, the community outreach engagement work that we did in the next section. Uh, Kristen Rattan will, will give some more information on the, the community outreach work that we did. Um, but we, you know, we, we learned that library publishers need need tools that, that really work for the workflows that, that they use, that their communities want, um, and that build upon existing software that is already, that they already have adopted, that is already uh, embedded in, in their workflows, and that is, is, um, is maintained and developed by values-aligned organizations. And library publishers also, so they don't just, they can't, these tools alone aren't enough to, to uh, solve this problem of transforming the scholarly communications sector uh, writ large. Library publishers also need partners who can contribute to a sustainable and values aligned ecosystem over time. Um, they need partners who, who adhere to ethical and sustainable business practices who contribute back to the maintainers of other open source components that, that they use. Um, co who cooperatively maintain and enhance software with other open source software developers and maintainers who can provide the kinds of flexible, scalable, and cost-effective solutions that can work for the, the varied models that library publishers employ and, and that engage stakeholders in the roadmap development in the production of software so that, that treat library publishers as true partners in development and who um, are committed to this, uh, to a values driven model, uh, business and governance models over, over the long term. Our approach to addressing these, uh, to a, uh, change in this area then is is driven by collective action. So simultaneous and collaborative work along multiple vectors and, and across multiple communities to bring those communities together in service of creating holistic solutions. So the NGLP project is, is working on seeding, uh, seeding work in three areas, connecting a values aligned community, coordinating a values aligned technology build, and cultivating a values aligned service model and network of service providers. You'll hear more about the results of our work in these areas in, in, over the, the next half hour and, and the follow, in the following section of the, the forum today as we introduce our pilot partners uh, and pilot implementations and demo the new technologies that we've developed under the auspices of NGLP. We're also really proud to release a report today, uh, Growing a Forest, Values-Aligned Approaches to, to Transformative Scholarly Communication, which is a report on the second year accomplishments of the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. And that also further describes the framework that's, that I'm uh, talking to you about today and that is guiding the approach to all of the uh, discrete components of the NGLP project. And that is the, this uh, values alignment is at the core of NGLP's approach and our philosophy. 
um, underlying all of NGLP's work is the tenet that scholarly communication activities are uh, should be operating within a context of shared values and should be working to advance those values. There is, that we believe strongly that there's a deep connection between values alignment and scholarly communication. These are interlinked activities, and you uh, and and should be uh, working in. Um, and all scholarly communications activities should be working from a place of values alignment. So what, what are our community's shared values? Um, scholars and scholarly communications stakeholders have, have uh, critiqued the scholarly publishing industry and called for change in practices over the past several decades and resulting in, in more than 100 manifestos and declarations, open letters and descriptive lists of, of values um, uh, to date. And an analysis conducted of these different statements and manifestos uh, conducted by the NGLP's project team in 2020 shows that the values and principles espoused across a, a wide range of these statements uh, are remarkably consistent. And our analysis also indicated that while some of these initiatives have called for explicit alignment with these values and principles uh, in order to create heuristics for, for, uh, for libraries to uh, or other communities to uh, select partners uh, or, or choose where to invest resources, the, these statements have not yet provided mechanisms that enable those involved in publishing to concretely evaluate and improve their own practices in this regard or to enable funders and investors to use values alignment to, uh, to inform their partnership decisions or procurement decisions. Based on the findings of, the, of, of, that, uh, of that work, we have been collaborating, uh, and this is uh, Catherine Skinner and I have been collaborating with a range of academic stakeholders to more concretely define their values and principles in terms of measurable actions so that these statements and uh, these uh, uh, alignment can be more readily assessed and audited. In 2020, we, we proposed and vetted an initial methodology um, and we are have been exploring ways to structure this, an assessment framework that, um, that encourages accountability uh, and, or in, and incentivizes accountability without putting up uh, undue barriers to participation, especially for, for newer or uh, less, uh, less re well-resourced communities. Um, and, uh, and, and we want to discourage the kind of gaming the system activities that accompany audits and rank ranking mechanisms. Um, we can, had a public comment period and requested feedback from findings on a pilot of an, of a, an assessment framework. Um, uh, this uh, assessment was conducted uh, for, for us by Invest in Open Infrastructure. And we used the results of that and community feedback to, uh, to refine what we are calling the forest framework, which connects commonly agreed upon values and principles with evidence-based measurable criteria. The framework will be issued formally issued later this spring, and it makes visible the ongoing values aligned policies and practices of all actors who engage with the NGLP environment, incentivizing them to intentionally improve their alignment with these values over time. So the the six values that the forest uh, that we've distilled in this forest framework. Um, include financial and organizational resilience, that's the F, openness, O, uh, R for responsible governance, uh, E for equity, accessibility, and anti-oppression, S for sharing of knowledge, and T for transparency. And uh, the framework, the assessment framework that we have developed as part of the NGLP project includes instruments for self-assessment and reflection that can be used by many stakeholders in scholarly communication, including library publishers and the tool developers and service providers that support their work. 
we've designed these instruments to recognize growth and progress rather than just results, uh, to identify strengths rather than just deficits, and to center aspirations rather than just descriptions of the current state. So the framework prompts communities to consider what values does my community hold currently? How do we demonstrate and communicate our commitment to these values? Through what actions can we, do we manifest our values and, and through what actions could we manifest our values more effectively? And how do our actions and decisions affect other participants in the scholarly communication system? And for each value, the framework elaborates a hierarchical set of principles, indicators, and evidence. Uh, so values being qualities that that we consider that we that we believe the academic community considers intrinsically desirable. Principles being standard standards of conduct that are derived from those values and that are intended to provide guidance on translating values into action. And the principles that we define in this framework concern both ethics and effectiveness. That is, we, we are, they're designed to articulate the, the standards of conduct that indicate good faith and cooperative participation in scholarly communications, um, and that also contribute to organizational success and effectiveness. Uh, we add to these indicators. So the indicators are the practical context appropriate manifestations of principles in a community's uh, you know, uh, operations and activities, and then evidence, the specific and concrete documentation that substantiates a community's adherence to an indicator. So we have uh, NGLP's own work reflects and is grounded in this framework and, and these values and principles. It serves as the backbone for our approach and it guides our outputs and outcomes. And we're not the only ones. The forest framework is already helping to inform other values aligned institutions even prior to its release. Our two year outcomes uh, include five consortia using the draft framework to inform their strategic plans and more than 20 library publishers, tool developers and service providers actively aligning their work with the draft framework. We expect these outcomes to grow significantly as we launch the formal release uh, this spring. Uh, and we're also working closely with many of the initiatives that are behind the statements, manifestos, and frameworks that we that we referenced that I referenced earlier, uh, such as POSI uh, and IOI, to uh, coordinate efforts across uh, other organizations and initiatives that are interested in advancing values alignment in scholarly communications. And we'll be releasing a summary of a recent summit we held with some of these initiatives uh, this this spring as well. Um, you'll hear in in the next hour uh, about how we about how this uh, values aligned approach informed has informed the way that we have undertaken development to uh, to be transparent to um, favor open technology standards and protocols to um, to uh, um, to support uh, interoperability uh, and uh, and so we are really we really take seriously the and and want to live these values in practice in the NGLP process. Um, so we are um, and we know that we uh, and the working in this framework has also allowed us to identify areas for improvement, the ways that we can um, can better align our activities with these values over time. So we are eager for community feedback on this second iteration of the forest framework, which we'll, we'll release uh, later this spring. So make sure to sign up for our newsletter, which you can do through the website nglp2022.org uh, to be alerted when we formally release this version of the assessment framework and, and our request for comments. Um, I'm also interested in hearing in uh, as we uh, uh, we'll have a little bit of time for a Q&A uh, now to, to hear your thoughts on this, uh, the idea of taking a values aligned approach to activities in the scholarly communications sector and to answer any questions you might have about, uh, about the forest framework or how it is, uh, is being used in our work. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so I'm, I'm here to moderate um, 
this uh, brief discussion about what Sarah's just presented on. And I don't see any open questions yet, so I will ask one. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about how this forest framework um, attends to the problem of uh, organizations with diff different levels of resourcing and, and the mismatches between their resourcing and their, um, their desire to be in alignment with, uh, with these kinds of values? Absolutely. Um, you can see in the, the screenshot on this slide that for each, um, for, each, uh, for each indicator, it is kind of organized. I know this text is quite small, but you'll be able to see if you, if you look at the drafts um, that each indicator is, is either in, is, uh, classified as appropriate for communities at all stages or ma mature communities. So we've taken a, a kind of first pass at, at, um, at you know, what, what are the baseline expectations for any community that's participating in the scholarly communication sector? What, what do we think is either so important or, you know, so uh, fundamental that any community should be able to do this? And then what are the, what are the um, aspirational goals for, what should be the aspirational goals for those communities? And what do we expect of a mature, well-established, well-resourced community? Um, those expectations might be, might be different, might be higher. Um, and so we have deliberately uh, designed the framework to take into account those contexts. Um, and we also, um, in addition to the checklist, we have uh, each, um, each set of values comes with a set of, of, uh, of prompts, questions that the community can ask itself that guide them toward, that they can kind of use as a facilitation guide for internal assessment of how they align with those values. So again, focusing on how do we move towards these goals? How do we reflect on what our current practices are? Um, and so using this not as a, a, a tool that is intended to um, be punitive or to uh, to uh, just you know show where places aren't measuring up, but as a tool for progress and for for uh, community self reflection. That's great. Um, okay, so anybody who has a, a question, you can go to the Q and A button at the bottom of the Zoom um, and type your question in there or a comment. Um, I think so I saw Martin, Martin uh, had raised his hand. Oh, okay. So we're, okay. So we're now we're going to, well, I, I'm not, we can't see everyone who's participating. So for all of you who are not part of the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A um, to, to share your question or thought. Um, Kristen has her hand up. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, and I can, um, <clears throat> I think throwing a question in the chat might be the easiest thing for folks. So please just make use of that. This is informal. Um, so one of the exciting things I've found um, is that, that there are others that are just picking up this uh, framework and taking and using it in their own activities. And we're not always aware, right? So one thing that would be really interesting is to, is to start to collect up some of these case studies of people who have found this valuable in their own working lives and how they've used it and what they've, you know, get feedback on a regular basis. So we begin to build actually community engagement and support around the framework itself. Absolutely. I, I love that idea. And um, we, this is a tool that we have designed uh, to be for community for the community to adapt and to respond to you know this is our uh this is based on you know our extensive conversations with members of the community on our our analysis and evaluation of the various statements that have been put out there but we don't consider this definitive um you know it's not a uh, values and principles can't be a top-down activity it comes from from the community and so we are eager to see how um you know, which of these uh, values and principles and, uh, resonate with different communities, wh where they think maybe indicators or evidence are, are not, uh, it could be enriched or where they're, um, uh, you know, where they think different, different types of evidence might be more appropriate to demonstrate alignment. 
Um, so we're, uh, I, um, I, I think it's, it's a great idea to start collecting those, those use cases and um, building that community of practice. Um, okay, so um, any any additional thoughts or questions from anyone? Feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, you can do uh, you can add it to the Q and A. Um, we are also uh, running a little bit behind because of our earlier glitch, so we could transition at this point if there are no further thoughts to the uh, pilot section of the presentation. Okay, I think we should. We should move on and please, as things come to come to your mind, um, add them in and we will circle back around in the next Q&A. Great, well, I'm taking it from here. Um, so Sarah, if you wanna flip, yeah, great. So um, while all of this values and principles work was happening, um, another section of NGLP that I led worked on gathering up as much information from the community as we could. One of the great things that the generous funding from Arcadia, thank you, Ross Mounts, was able, allowed us to do is to not just jump to, hey, we're going to build something new, but to actually really spend a full year talking to you all, talking to the community. We engaged with over 100 different people and entities during that period of time in different ways, surveys and requests for information. We did workshops, um, all of that. And um, uh, and participated in conference activities. And we got so much amazing feedback. And then that allowed us to really uh, adapt our program to meet the needs of the community where they stood today, not where they wanna be in 10 years, but what are their immediate needs and how can we bridge their experiences into these new pathways? How can we help them get there? So what we heard from the community very briefly, and we covered this in the report that we've shared, is people were interested most urgently in journal and journal plus IR solutions. Um, we didn't hear IR only, we didn't hear yet. I mean, books, uh, OER, preprints were all on the list, but the most urgent area were journal solutions and journal plus IR. Uh, and they also said very clearly, we need this to be hosted and turnkey. Um, those who are already on a hosted service wanted to continue to be on and move to a new one. And those who are doing it themselves with their own open source installations, many of them were ready to shift that as an outsource. So we decided we needed to make sure everything, of course, is open source. Everything is community owned and governed. Um, and it can be used either in-house by an IT team within an institution, or we were going, we, we acknowledged we needed to set up service providers who are trusted, who fit with the forest framework um, and who are really interested in serving this community. We also heard from everyone, don't try to build one big new thing, um, you know, build on existing open source uh, platforms and tools that we know and love and fill in some gaps. So that helped us identify the two areas we wanted to focus on development in and then what are the open source platforms that we want to engage with invest in and inter, you know, uh, make interoperable into this system. Um, the need for service providers was super important. People said, we just don't wanna have to try to roll our own open source, so to speak. <clears throat> and then they helped us identify where there were gaps, um, where the, the you know, inspired by, for example, CDLZ scholarship, which Catherine Mitchell will talk about, how can we combine all of our content in a really interesting and dynamic way and display that and create collections and do all kinds of things um, that, that bring IR content, for example, up to the level of journal content and bring our journal content up to the level of some of the most sort of fancy commercial journal sites. So those were, those were goals. And then the, one of the other goals um, was around analytics and how do we have kind of united and clear analytics that help guide our, our programs. <clears throat> so the, um, there were a lot of other needs and wants, a lot of interest in doing what I would call sort of some of the more innovative uh, solutions around complex types of publishing, data-driven sites, digital humanities projects, and all of that. But we all realized we have to start with a, a, a foundation from which to be able to move in those directions. So we devised this modular architecture 
That was the technology portion of the work. We engaged with uh, two different development shops, Cast, uh, Cast Iron Coding for our web delivery platform and Cottage Labs for the analytics dashboard. And then we brought together partners uh, such as Janeway. Uh, we've been working with DSpace. We've been in communication with OJS, PKP, and lots of others to participate in this work. Uh, we've and then lined up some service providers like Janeway, who is both a builder and a service provider and uh, Longleaf Services out of UNC Press, which is uh, a service provider. And we've devised these pilots. So um, that's been really exciting to move us to the point where we're able to uh, actually launch tests of all of this. And this is like roughly two years into the project. And I feel again, with our generous funder behind us, we were able to take that time to really get it right. And so far the feedback as we've had user communities and we've had forums like this, the feedback has been really, really positive. People can see themselves in this ecosystem and see themselves using these services that we're launching uh, via the pilots. So I'll talk a little bit now uh, about the, the pilots. You can see, uh, you can go to the next slide, thanks. You can see from this high level architecture that we, we, we focused on the web delivery platform, WDP, and the analytics dashboard as the things we were developing, but we are leveraging these existing platforms out here um, that people are already know. So manuscript submission, for example, can come from OJS or Janeway. Uh, one of our pilots is focusing on, on Janeway as a service provider. So of course it uses that manuscript submission system. And then for example, content can come from popular IRs like DSpace and others. And then they move into this environment where they are able to be published along um, and where journals can be alongside other kinds of IR content and they can mix and match and create collections and then um, uh, be uh, analyzed through the analytics dashboard. So that's sort of the high level mar um, modular architecture. We can go into more detail. We have a lot of very open documentation we can share on all of that for people who wanna dig in. So this led us to the formation of three specific pilots, which will be by no means the only pilots that get done. We have a whole list of, of second round pilots we're, we're eager to start with, but these first three are gonna help us understand three key use cases. One pilot, pilot number one is a consortial library publishing use case. This is the one run by CDL and it's helping CDL to upscale all of its own um, internal uh, tools, a lot of which CDL developed themselves and are now they're eager to shift to community run open source alternatives like the ones we're building and the ones that we're, um, we're working with. Um, and so, the, that same modular architecture allows CDL to you know, be a digital library that replaces components that they're running today with better components, more modern uh, software and, uh, and, and things that integrate nicely. Uh, so CDL will be, is first of all, they're doing a great job sharing the, the burden of, for example, how do you test migration of content from DSpace into the web delivery platform and things like that. So they're helping to drive some of the development and they'll be able to share out the results of what they've learned and hopefully help other uh, consortial library publishing groups to offer similar solutions or mix and match their own version of that. Uh, pilot number two is uh, what does it look like to have a fully hosted turnkey journal plus IR solution that can compete with commercial solutions that are out there. Um, and this pilot is led by Janeway as service provider and includes Janeway as manuscript submission system and the web delivery platform and the analytics dashboard. So this pilot um, is really for it's it will we have about five part you know library publishers who have signed up to be these first pilot partners. But of course, what we're doing is setting up a service that can meet the needs of the library publishing community at large. Um, and for those looking for a combined journal and IR solution, uh, this, this would be your, your, your pathway here. Um, so this, what's exciting about this is that it offers the ability to use any of the IR solutions. We're sort of working first with DSpace uh, because that's the one that's most commonly used. 
but we can migrate content out of any existing um, service providers that you're using today and pull them into this environment. And we will be standing up journal and initially ETD content as a demonstration case with these five library publishers. And we'll be announcing more about who they are and what the timing of this all is gonna be and what you'll be able to see and watch from, 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 uh, from your own living rooms. Um, so that's a really exciting pilot. The third pilot uh, is being run by Longleaf, I mentioned, out of UNC Press, and this is a new journal publishing program. So for those who are looking for a journal solution, maybe don't have an alternative for IRs or don't have an IR, this is a targeted journals program that will rival commercial services, and there are many out there, and a lot of journals that you know we've been in contact with through library publishing or other nonprofit uh, uh, journal services are looking for a mission aligned partnership for their journals program. And, uh, and this is, uh, this is going to be piloting that concept. Uh, Longleaf um, will be working initially with some uh, UNC press and local journals within the UNC system. And they'll be able to offer things like cross journal collection building and branding and analytics that will help uh, journals, you know, either single or multi-journal publishers to be able to have a really modern, um, fully discoverable, fully machine readable solution. And so with the technology that we're, we're building here with the web delivery platform and the analytics dashboard, this is very much like the kind of architecture that you would find with the most popular kind of high-end journal publishing vendors and allows for, for example, full text HTML eventually to be able to be offered and allows for much more fluid uh, use and reuse of content uh, in that mixing and matching, much higher levels of discoverability and more compliance with standards. So we've invited each of our pilot partners to tell you a little bit more about why they're here and why they're excited to be a part of this. And then, um, you know, visit the site that we put the link in, uh, NGLP 2020, 2022. And, uh, and, and then don't forget to sign up for our newsletter and learn more. We have a user group ongoing and it's got lots and lots of people in it. And we have user group meetings that you can then come to and give us much more detailed input. And we, uh, there's a very participatory uh, and they're very much about like deriving community feedback for what we're doing. And thanks. Okay. I'll start with CDL. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit more context for how uh, how CDL got involved and why we're thrilled to be part of this piloting process. Um, so this year marks the 20th anniversary for eScholarship as a library publisher. The program is run by the California Digital Library, or CDL, and provides open access publishing services for the 10 UC campuses, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and the UC Office of the President. We have found uh, in these last 20 years uh, a compelling niche for the library publisher in supporting emerging fields, interdisciplinary work, the work of underrepresented voices in scholarly communication, <clears throat> and any other uh, kind of publication that either isn't well served by um, the commercial publishing marketplace or seeks an alternative to it. But eScholarship isn't just a publishing platform. It's also a repository and as such provides access to over 300,000 research objects from preprints to white papers to electronic theses and dissertations. It is also the repository where UC faculty continue to deposit tens of thousands of author versions of their publications under the UC open access policies. It's been important to us from the beginning of the e-scholarship program to provide services for a broad range of scholarly output and to co-locate these items and provide unified access to them regardless of type. We have a lot of different stakeholders that you see from entire campuses to departments to multi-campus research units, each with different goals for their content and different notions of what the kinds of co collections they want to build within the system look like. E-scholarship has faced some unique needs and challenges in working to provide access to this range of materials and range of expectations within a single platform. The metadata is inconsistent, yet we need a global search. The affiliations are often multiple for a single publication, and we need to display that publication everywhere that makes sense while still maintaining a single version. The ambitions of our authors are vastly distinct, with some seeking to redesign scholarly communication altogether, and others happy to stick with what they know, but now in an open environment. 
We have attempted to use established platforms, but have found none that are well positioned to support this kind of complexity in a coordinated publisher plus institutional repository role. We worked originally with the Berkeley Electronic Press to develop a combined publishing and institutional repository platform, which later became B Press's digital commons product, but we eventually outgrew that as well. And as a result, we found it necessary over the past two decades to build custom solutions to try to accommodate the complexities we face and provide a set of compelling publishing and distribution services to our academic community. The problem with custom solutions, of course, is that they're custom. And that means that when it comes to maintaining them, we're the only ones home. So while we have been in the business for years of providing just the kind of publishing and institutional repository solution that NGLP is working toward, the high level view of CDL's current architecture, as you can see on this slide, explains why we are thrilled to be piloting NGLP's tools and platforms. As you can see, all of our current systems are both idiosyncratic and out of date. This pilot is enabling us to engage more directly in community-led open source platforms for our journal and institutional repository workflows, where the work of maintaining and even advancing the systems is shared among a broad, broad, broader set of stakeholders and not just within our team. So in place of our custom IR framework and our long ago forked and now pretty much obsolete OJS instance, we will be using DSpace 7.0 and Janeway respectively. And in place of our custom web display system and stats service, both of which take a significant toll on our technical team just to maintain and lack some of the features our diverse groups of stakeholders would like, we will be using state-of-the-art solutions created within the NGLP project for aggregated display of content and analytics. We're excited to test run the WDP, the web discovery platform, because as described earlier, it isn't just a front-end display. It's a schema-driven system that has the flexibility and the robustness to avoid the kinds of genericizing compromises that we too often face in displaying a range of content that's diverse. And we're really looking forward to being able to track activity in the system from a centralized dashboard. Running 90 plus journals with a small staff is a tall order. Being able to proactively identify those publications and those research units that are flagging will give us an opportunity to intervene and provide assistance in a timely way. And our users can't wait for use, usage stats that render as something more than a spreadsheet. So we will be running this pilot alongside our production system to test its ability to support the workflows and services that our large community of authors and researchers demand. We have high hopes for this set of solutions and are excited to watch the built-in extensibility unfold, making it easy to slot in other journal management systems, other institutional repository platforms, and new systems that support new kinds of scholarly research outputs as they continue to emerge in this space. Okay, um, next on to Martin Eve. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here this evening. Uh, I've been asked to speak for four minutes, but I'm an academic, so you know that might be difficult for me to stick to that. I'll try not to run over too much. I guess I want to just quickly back up to the very origin of why we created a publishing platform in-house, um, as opposed to going with the existing solutions that, that exist out there in the world. And a lot of it was about having some control over the technologies that we use in our publishing activities. So originally this was sculpted for the Open Library of Humanities and we were incredibly grateful to PKP for open journal systems. As we grew though, and as we started to meet new demands for different technologies, different capacities and so on, we found that we simply couldn't adapt the existing technologies with the ease that we wanted. Uh, we also noted that um, as technologies go through a life cycle and become more and more complex, it becomes harder and harder for external entities to work with them. And so we went back to the drawing board and said, what can we design that gives us control over our workflows, allows us to change those workflows when new publishing opportunities present themselves like preprints, uh, like open peer review and so on? Um, and what can we do to make this process less magical? so that a developer who comes along can take what we've built um, and find a way of, of changing things and modifying it. Um, and that's really how Janeway started over a weekend hacking project. It was something internal, it was something for our own use. 
And really, it's been a story of, of growth from there, with others also seeing the potential that we saw in this project, taking it on board and doing things with it often that we, we wouldn't have anticipated, really that, that most joyous of open source moments where somebody takes your software and, say, repurpose it into an encyclopedia of science, which is what happened at Carnegie Mellon University with Janeway. I think one of the weaknesses, though, that we've always seen is that in, in the publishing space, it's very hard to move between different platforms. People get stuck in one particular ecosystem because there's no incentive or values alignment for platforms to develop ways to get their data out. Um, there's a lot of incentive on getting data in um, for everyone. Everyone wants you to be able to move to their platform. But to really think properly about bi-directionality of data, to think about layers that can sit on top of generic technologies that don't uh, compete but that interoperate with one another is something we don't often consider very much. And I think given the, the short period of time I've been given to present, this is the number one takeaway that I want to, to put out there from, from what we're getting from this. Um, we have a service um, provision aspect to what we're doing. You know, we, we fund our development operation by um, selling our services for hosting Janeway to library publishers and university presses. On the other hand, from our values perspective, we want people to be able to move between platforms seamlessly. And the Next Generation Library Publishing Project has really given us the impetus to start to think about what it means to help people to move between platforms, be that to Janeway or from Janeway. And the web delivery platform that sits on top of these different platforms and creates a smooth interoperability layer is really a great step for masking some of the idiosyncrasies of technology while still giving the flexibility of their specificities. So you can get the workflow from Janeway for your journal publishing that, that people want and that is different to that that you'd get from, say, PKP's OJS or, or other systems. But we can also have a unified display architecture that sits on top of that and that is client facing and that gives a familiarity and um, sort of consensual framework within which to operate. And so that's what's exciting for us. And this project has really given us the capacity to start to develop these technologies in, in quite an exciting way. Um, we haven't yet gone down the route of developing our own complete IR solution. That was definitely beyond the scope of the pilot. But we've also been thinking with our, our customer base about how we can help them to display that content using, again, WDP, with which they're already familiar because it's also used for their journal content. So I'm going to stop talking there, but that's that's what excites us about the project. And we're really glad to be involved and, and thankful for everyone who's made this possible. Thanks, Martin. Um, that's great. And we're excited to be working with you on this. Um, OK, the third is uh, Long Leaf Services. And John Shearer is here to talk about that. Thanks, Kristen. It's good to see everybody. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. I'll offer a couple more details about um, our instance, although as usual, um, you know, Kristen did a fantastic job of uh, kind of outlining it for you. I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the unique structure of UNC Press because I think it kind of means something uh, about why why we're different than the couple of the other models that you, you've seen. So UNC Press sits on the Chapel Hill campus, but we're part of the statewide uh, University of North Carolina system of uh, 16 campuses. The core work of the press is pretty traditional stuff, monograph publishing, um, regional trade, a handful of journals. But because we've been successful, we've had resources to expand what we do as a publisher. And the first thing we did was 15 years ago, uh, we created something called Longleaf Services. So Longleaf is a separate 501c3 nonprofit owned by UNC Press. And it was started simply as kind of a back end fulfillment, um, uh, pick, pack, and ship, and accounts receivable. But we quickly realized, or I realized when I got here, that university presses really lack back end scale. And that's where, you know, publishing keeps consolidating and all the growth was about consolidation and presses, university presses have to grow organically. So, how could we get the benefits of scale? So, we expanded the suite of services that Longleaf does. But we wanted to build those services with that type of shared values that Sarah was describing, because a lot of the services that we found just didn't share our values. To be clear, we, we actually don't build a lot of things ourselves, but we find partners and tools that benefit our presses but operate at scale. So sometimes we almost call ourselves a brokerage on behalf of our um, 19 presses. 
So again, we're at the UNC system. So uh, 19 camp or 17 campuses um, and it's really diverse. So Chapel Hill is a big kind of flagship normal campus. Uh, NC State is the biggest campus in the system. It's a uh, land grant university, very focused on uh, STEM. Uh, but you also have the UNC School of the Arts, which is a performing arts school, uh, UNC Asheville, which is a liberal arts college with 4,500 students. Um, I see Ann Moore from UNC Charlotte. UNC Charlotte is a big urban-based uh, university, uh, becoming a national university very quickly. Uh, the UNC School of Science and Math. So it's all over the place, big schools, little schools, liberal arts, uh, very vocational focused. So when I got here, I did a survey of the system to see what they wanted from their press. And the first thing I learned is that they didn't realize we were their press. Uh, our books used to say Chapel Hill on the spine. Our letterhead used to be Chapel Hill, Carolina Blue. So it made sense that they didn't know who we were. Um, but what was even kind of more shocking was, uh, sure, we heard from the humanists. They were like, publish more monographs, please. Not surprisingly. But most people told me they thought publishing was inherently broken and corrupt, which was kind of a stunning thing for me to hear as I stepped into the role of the director of UNC Press. So we created a division at the press called the Office of Scholarly Publishing Services so that we could fix that mismatch between what we were doing and what we were hearing from the campuses. They wanted faster publishing. They wanted to be more open, less expensive, and more innovative. And so we, and then the last thing that we learned from the campuses most importantly was that the library was the hub where the push for more innovation, innovative publishing was coming from. So when we created our Office of Publishing Services, it, it was networked with the libraries. And um, I'm, I'm thinking about Anne again at Charlotte, they've done incredible open educational resource work and some institutional histories. And it's been great having our back end scale at UNC Press and Longleaf in the background of helping them to do those things to make it easy for them to have a publishing program um, and uh, and just removing lots of the obstacles that, that a, a library might feel if they were starting to. But the truth is, we always understood that journals was where people really needed help. I'm thinking about a time when Elaine Westbrooks, who was the soon to be departed head of the UNC Chapel Hill Library, um, was negotiating with Elsevier and she sat in my office. She said, John, what can you do to help me with this problem I have at Elsevier? And I just sort of shrugged my shoulders like we're just this little public university press. What could we possibly do? We were unprepared to solve this alone. And this goes back to the scale thing that just I say every day here. So I was delighted with the opportunity to join this group because it was the first time somebody walked in my door and, and kind of started to talk about a solution that um, that could address this, this huge problem that was there. Um, we intend, as, as Kristen pointed out, we're gonna have Janeway as kind of our front end instance. We're gonna use cast iron coding to help us uh, host uh, the web delivery platform and the analytics dashboard. We're going to build a UNC system-wide, statewide instance. We'll migrate a lot of existing content, but most importantly, we want to jumpstart new publishing opportunities. There are campuses like uh, UNC Wilmington and UNC Asheville that want to build journals programs from scratch, and we think we can help them. There are the mega campuses like NC State and Chapel Hill that have scores of journals that are being published by partners that lack the values we've been talking about. But there's also lots of self-published ones that are just, they're trying really hard, but it's super inefficient as anyone who has tried to self-publish a startup journal knows. We wanna present the scholarship in both a system-wide lens, that kind of unified approach like Martin was describing, as well as something that works at a campus level and even a departmental kind of nesting. So NGLP is just so far out ahead of anything else that we've seen. And we feel like we've got a great model where we're at the press connected to these campuses and we can create these modular partnerships that Kristen was referring to with the libraries. It can be a turnkey or it can be a la carte depending on what they want. And then our super hyper ambition at UNC is to use this at Longleaf with the Longleaf network of presses to make this even more extensible, to make other university press partners, potentially partners with our libraries do it. I call it NGLP in a to-go box. Thanks. That's great. I really like that, John. Um, <clears throat> one of the exciting things about building something like this that has that kind of flexibility, you can assemble different solutions, you can meet the needs of different niche groups, is that it really it, it it opens up lots of possibilities and lots of potential service layers so um, people can assemble whatever solution makes sense to them and i think we're we're already talking with many other service providers who are interested in creating unique situate services for their own niche groups i mean obviously pkp is a natural and we invited them to join the program and they're very excited to do so um, there are others uh, as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I think, what are we now at q and I think we're gonna combine the, the Q&A with the one at the end and jump right into the product demos just to keep us uh, on time. Perfect. 
So I'm excited to be able to share demos of our two software components with you today. These, uh, these demos represent the culmination of a year of development work from our exceptional partners at Cast Iron Coating and Cottage Labs. And I think you'll see what I mean by exceptional when you see how much we've been able to accomplish in what is really a, a short amount of time. We have additional technical documentation available on both components on our website. Uh, and um, the code is also available on GitHub for you to explore. Um, interoperability is at the heart of these tools, as you've heard. They're designed to build upon what already works, these widely adopt, adopted platforms that already work well for our community and are maintained by values-aligned organizations. The web delivery platform de developed by our partners at Cast Iron Coding empowers library publishers to showcase their full portfolio in a single modern portal while maintaining submission and review workflows that are optimized for different content types. As Martin mentioned, such as use, utilizing Janeway for review workflows, uh, submission and peer review workflows for, for journals and DSpace for um, theses and dissertations. And the WDP's attractive and content aware and customizable templates showcase that range of content types um, and organize them into distinct communities and collections. The WDP actually comprises three different components. First, it has an API that is responsible for storing all of the content, including files and metadata and the schemas that govern how, how all of those things display and behave. Um, in the front end. Um, and the API exposes this, this content to the other uh, two components through a GraphQL API. The GraphQL API allows these other applications to query and mutate the stored data and expose it in different ways. The, uh, web, the WDP web delivery platform's admin interface is a web application built with JavaScript, React, and Next.js. And authenticated users can use the admin interface to create and manage content and to configure the settings in the WDP. Content can be created from scratch in the admin interface uh, in addition to the ingest pathways that we have, have developed to pull in content from other systems. And finally, the WDP's front-end interface is a web application built with JavaScript, React, and Next.js uh, that displays this content for the end user. Um, so I'm going to start off our demo with this gorgeous front end. And uh, given our time constraints, this is really just the highlights, not an exhaustive look at the features that are available. All right. Um, Um, I'm going to just share the screen. All right. Hopefully you all are seeing, uh, seeing the WDP front page, which displays the instances, top level communities, different adopters of the platform will have different ways of organizing their portfolio. So a consortial instance, like the one that CDL is building might have campuses as top level collections like the UC Merced campus that you see here. An individual instance for a small liberal arts college might just have two of these top level communities, one for journals and one for institutional repository content, or maybe just one single community. Let's take a closer look at the fake university community. So the landing page for Fake University allows some light customization, such as changing the hero image and adding a logo. And administrators can select multiple collections to feature here. Um, and uh, we can also feature an individual issue and give readers a peek at its contents. Taking a closer look at the Journal of Academic Thought, the landing page, again, is slightly customizable with a, a logo and hero image and appropriate metadata. Um, static pages and announcements provide a home for journal information, and we can e easily feature the current issue, recent issues, and related journals. And we can also browse uh, journal content um, by issue or uh, take a look at all of the articles in the journal. Article pages um, 
like this one are designed to display uh, full text HTML where that's available or an embedded PDF viewer where necessary alongside full metadata records uh, for, the art, for the article and article level metrics. That feature is still in progress. Um, and then a uh, contributor record showcases an individual author's works in the platform alongside some biographical information. Customizable JSON schemas uh, are governing the content and metadata display and behavior. And the built-in templates, uh, I've just shown you, a, you know, a journal article template specifically are tailored to different content types to ensure that that um, a white paper or student thesis looks as polished as a digital first journal article and, and has the, the right metadata and the right display features that really make it shine. And using these schemas as the underlying structure really gives the WDP outstanding control and flexibility um, over how content is displayed and how it behaves. And we're working with widely adopted metadata standards like JATS, and mods for metadata that are harvested through OAI PMH. Um, and, uh, and so we are, we're really um, putting interoperability and standards-based uh, standards uh, metadata at the heart of this, this application. All right, I'm going to um, share next. Uh, Next up, we have the web delivery platforms admin interface. So this is where repository administrators or service providers can manage communities, collections, and items, the three broad content types defined in the WDP. As you saw on the front end, each of these types of objects can be, uh, each of these can be tailored for a specific purpose. For example, a community could be assigned special properties that make it function as a campus in a consortial instance. A collection might be a department or it might be an individual journal, depending on the properties assigned. And we have two item types defined in our MVP uh, articles, journal articles and theses with the intention to expand the range of templates are available for lots of other content types to give them the, the uh, polished appearance that um, polished and customized experience. Um, keep in mind that, that a book object that's just a PDF with basic metadata might function just fine in one of our article templates, um, but these dedicated schemas that we define in the future will really be optimized uh, and, and, and ensure that we avoid the kind of genericizing look of, of some, that some repositories give to different types of content while still being able to aggregate that different, those different types. So let's take a look at communities. We can easily make adjustments to a community's properties, such as the branding and uh, featured content for its landing page here. So we can adjust a community's metadata, um, uh, add a logo, um, hero image, and select what content is featured on that homepage. Um, we can also manage the content within a community. So a community's immediate children must be collections, which in this case is three journals. And from this screen, we can add new collections and manage the existing ones. We can edit a collections properties. Again, um, you know, easily pull up the metadata and content associated with uh, the, the um, collections landing page. And we can also um, we can also manage its behavior, uh, relationships, and associated entities. So, for example, we can add pages or announcements, uh, um, like the editorial board page or submission instructions, add announcements. We can add links there to related content, those that show up on the journal landing page. And finally, uh, collections can have children that are items. So when we drill down to manage this journal's content, we can see our articles. 
Currently, you can manually upload articles through the admin interface. The batch ingest process via OAI PMH is currently a command line function, but this is on our near-term roadmap to build out the interfaces that allow admins to see content being pulled from the upstream systems so that non-technical users can see what's being pushed in from Janeway or DSpace or pulled in from Janeway and DSpace and approve it to be published or set up and remove embargoes, et cetera. Um, through this screen, we can also edit the metadata for existing items uh, and, and again, manage their behavior and their relationship to other entities. So here we're pulling up again the, uh, an item's uh, metadata. We can add all sorts of metadata. This, this record isn't even fully, uh, fully populated with all of the, uh, the different kinds of metadata that we can, um, can embed here. And again, all of that is auto-populated as we pull in from OAI PMH. And you know, we can, again, manage, uh, manage the different attributes here. We can add contributors and supplemental files to this item. Um, and uh, links to related content, et cetera. And finally, we can, uh, we can look at an individual contributor and edit the metadata about that person. And um, speaking of contributors, we can also manage users and contributors and grant them roles within the system. Um, we're still uh, building out the different kinds of permissions and user roles that are available. Um, uh, and um, but there, there will be very granular uh, permissions and access structures built into the WDP. We believe the UX on the admin side is just as important as on the front end. And, and we really think that this admin interface makes it easy and intuitive to manage collections and content so that library publishers can focus on publishing rather than fighting with software. Um, and, and both the back and front end bring a level of polish, professionalism, and, and, a, and joy or pleasure to publishing. We really think these tools are a joy to use and to look at. And so our work wouldn't be complete. Uh, no. Sorry, I'm uh, having a, just pulling up the last demo here. Um, here we go. All right, um, our work wouldn't be complete without a way to measure engagement uh, with this content and to facilitate strategic planning and management of your, your portfolio. Our analytics dashboard developed by our partners at Cottage Labs ingests and normalizes workflow and engagement data from disparate sources into a single platform, uh, giving you unmatched oversight over your portfolio. Our MVP ships with a set of compelling built-in reports that are tailored to different audiences and are populated with dynamic visualizations. The analytics dashboards archival content store allows administrators to access unprocessed data to ensure its integrity and, uh, and to allow you to build custom reports in another in any other open source business intelligence platform such as Kibana, for example. Um, and visualization and visualizations and metrics will also be embedded directly into the web delivery platform as I, as I showed you. Um, giving users convenient access to this uh, data at the point of need. Today, you'll see a preview of our first suite of reports. With input from our pilot partners, we'll be refining these, focusing on improving things like labeling and adding filters. And we'll also be designing new reports and visualizations to address additional use cases. First up is our engagement uh, or uh, readership report for collection managers. This report provides library publishers with a bird's eye view of engagement metrics collected from the web delivery platform. Refinements to this report as we move beyond MVP will also allow users to drill down through the content hierarchy to see journal and article level metrics. Users uh, of this report can select a date range and narrow the results by, uh, by date or by the types of interactions or content that they're interested in. 
And they can also switch uh, between a, this chart view and a table view. As we scroll down, we see the map view of engagement data, which gives us insight into the locations of our readers. Um, to protect privacy, this view doesn't permit us to identify individual or institutional IP uh, ranges or addresses. And the map is also a navigation device. So as we zoom in, um, uh, we'll see uh, uh, not only be able to see more granularly into the data there, but we'll see the uh, chart, the figures on the chart adjust as well. Next, we'll take a look at our workflow metrics report. This report helps repository administrators and journal or journal editors or other uh, decision makers monitor their publication workflows ba based on data from the submission and review platforms. Um, so the first visualization shows the number of articles at each stage of a typical publication workflow, as well as the average time to progress to the next stage and the average age of each item at that stage. The second visualization prevents, presents the average age of items in the workflow over a period of time. And this visualization can help publishers identify bottlenecks and recognize seasonal patterns in submission and publication, and thus predict and plan for resourcing needs. We can't wait to pilot all of these components with real users and real data. We're eager to define our next steps for refining and adding features to both components and connecting them to the many other initiatives that are building open infrastructure and data to support mission-driven publishing. And um, so I'm, I'm eager to hear, hear your, your questions and comments, but, bef but first, um, Kristen's gonna tell you a little bit more about, about how we are connecting with related initiatives. Yeah, and I put a lot of the roadmap information in the chat because we won't have time to go through each thing. But suffice to say, so far our experience with this has 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 reinforced that metadata is hugely important. Um, that we need to work on improving metadata from the, you know, the the ingest and, and submission side, and 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 make sure that we can enrich it by using third party services like Crossref or Data Site, um, so that we're getting the best possible metadata for all of the content that goes through. And that will help with discoverability, which is I think one of the most critical missing pieces today in a lot of um, library publishing initiatives and just in general nonprofit uh, publishing initiatives. So those are some interesting, exciting things. HTML display for content that can, can, can be displayed that way. Uh, opening up the door to lots of other kinds of content. And we're super eager to hear from everybody what what their most their highest priorities are for between things like preprints, books, OER, um, and then other kind of more non-traditional publications. Um, so we're really interested in hearing that and in defining those use cases. Uh, and then also, you know, working with more partners. So as I mentioned, PKP is an obvious one and helping uh, OJS users move to more modern OJS instances, the, the latest version of it, interest from, for example, AirUD, but also uh, service providers outside of North America who are meeting the needs of their communities. So we're hearing from them. The fact is this is a very flexible set of, 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 of infrastructures that work with other open source infrastructures. So the potential is kind of limitless in terms of what we could, how we, what we could reach. So I've heard, for example, from um, from others who are just trying to create collections of varying kinds that might be considered more like an overlay. Uh, and I think that's really exciting because the WDP doesn't have to necessarily always replace what someone's using, it can augment it. So there are a lot of, um, yeah, CDL is already working with preprints. And so they're really interested in how, how they can expand in that area. So we're gonna be doing a lot of that work. Uh, we'll be publishing our roadmap once we have these pilots underway. We'll be sharing information about how well the pilots are doing, what we're learning from that, um, and uh, giving people an opportunity to visualize some of that. And then we'll be looking at what our next step roadmaps are gonna be. So keep in touch, uh, stay tuned to hear more about that. Sign up for a newsletter um, and just watch the space because there's gonna be a lot more coming up. Um, and again, I want to thank our funder, Arcadia, for making all of this possible and the list of partners that you see here uh, on the slide. It's just been an amazing group to work with. Uh, I think we're all really 
excited to have been able to be part of this so far and to do the next phase. Thanks again for bearing with the technical difficulties at the beginning. It was wonderful to see so many of you here and uh, we hope to see more of you in our user groups and uh, other spaces. So please do plug in and definitely keep up with what we're doing. Great, thanks. And we will be sharing the recording out so people can who weren't able to attend uh, can, can see what we're doing. But we'll definitely try to avoid the first 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can cut that part off. And thanks everyone in the chat for, for your uh, for your feedback. It's so great to, to get that kind of uh, affirmation from this community. Really appreciate it. All right.